Okay, so recommendations, we've talked about this in a previous talk. I've just brought it up to remind you again, so I won't go over it. Okay, very, very interesting. Um, head of the bed. So these are absolute simple things that when you go into a room, if they're not done, you can dramatically affect ICPs. And one of them is, is head positioning. A, a, a head that's 30 degree or down on the ground by lifting it 30 degrees can dramatically alter um, ICPs. And, and we see that in the ICU when we have codmins in, for example, and a kid might be 30 degrees when we bump them up to 40 degrees and sometimes we see the difference. So again, um, dramatic effects with head of the bed. But recognizing that a head of the bed is different for everybody. And I, I bring this up um, from a neonatal perspective as well. Um, really, why does bringing the head of the bed up help? It helps with venous drainage of the brain. And the venous drainage um, that you're gaining is the effect that gravity has on it. So when we think about it in the literature, um, typically we think about the third ventricle in the brain being at the level of the tragus. Again, the tragus, when we intubate, is that floppy thing that we want above the maneuverosternal joint. At the tr level of the, of the tragus is also your third ventricle in your brain. That is going to be draining CSF to your right atrium, and so that's where I drew this. But the effect that the drainage experience is the effect that gravity has, and so that's going to be your straight line. And you can see that gravity has this much effect on this adult. But suppose you had a neonatal patient who's going to be shorter. And at, still at 30 degrees, as soon as it's 30 degrees, this is where their tragus is, and this is where their RA is. A neonate, because they're shorter, still at 30 degrees, is going to have less than half the gravitational effect as an adult. And I bring this up because 30 degrees is not 30 degrees for everybody. So a big tall person like me, for example, would have a dramatically greater effect than somebody who's shorter. So 30 degrees you'll hear over and over and over again, but if you have somebody who's shorter, maybe they need 35, maybe they need 40 degrees. There's fairly good evidence though that there's a, there's a tipping point. And once you get to a certain tipping point, you stop getting further benefits from that. But I would say 30%, 30, 30 percent every single one of your traumatic patients, uh, TBI patients, ought to be at. And if things aren't working and they have a blown pupil, for example, and there's, there's, there's obvious badness going on, it's, I would raise their bed up to 40 degrees. The other thing we've seen is um, the collars are on too tight and then it blocks their drainage. Yeah, and that's a, that's a good point, Steph. So uh, a poorly fitting collar, um, your jugulars are, are going to be what's draining. The nice thing about a collar that fits properly is it gets the head in midline because even a slight little head roll like this is going to affect the drainage on one side with that little bit of torsion. So ideally you want to have that collar on, you want to have your head midline, starting point is 30 degrees. One caveat to that though is um, what happens when you put your head of the bed up to 30 degrees, what happens um, to uh, your hemodynamic status? If you're hypotensive, and I put your head of the bed up to 30 degrees, you are even going to underperfuse your brain more. So, again, for these patients who we want to decrease their ICP, we talk about patient optimization. If you're really, really struggling with MAPS, and their MAPS are low, 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 this, you have a decision to make, and likely the right decision is going to be to keep the head of the bed flat. Because if you don't have enough arterial pressure to go uphill and perfuse that brain, the benefits that you get of having the head of the bed up at 30 degrees are going to be less than the, uh, the ill effects that you're going to cause by exacerbating hypoperfusion to the brain. So these are the kits sometimes where you have to keep the head of the bed flat. You need to start peripheral dopamine, ramp that map up, and then put the head of the bed up. Um, so again, deep thoughts, so I'm quoting our own paper here. In the absence of invasive monitoring hypotension, the benefits of head ele elevating the head of the bed may outweigh, out may rare exacerbations of cerebral hypoperfusion. So if you have obvious, obvious, obvious low pressures, then lifting the head of the bed is probably not the best idea. But in any other sort of circumstances, 
put the head of the bed up 30 degrees. So acute management, um, as, as a review then, um, very quickly before we go into um, massaging some of the deeper points here. Assume as a starting point, everyone's got raised ICP. Know that you have hyperosmolar therapy in your pocket. And again, you would talk to medical control about that, mannitol or um, hypertonic saline. Avoid the big baddies, hypoxemia and hypotension. We talked about targeting CPP and how to calculate CPP. CO2 management is incredibly important. You need an end title for that. And uh, the last one is head of the bed. So really, all of these things that you can do in a very short period of time, very, very simple things. Uh, so now we start massaging um, how do we optimize our patient. Um, glucose control, very, very important. Um, this is why glucose ought to be your seventh vital. Um, hypoglycemia is obvious why it's bad for the brain. Your brain is in a metabolic crisis. In a lot of instances, it's not getting enough blood flow. The cerebral metabolic rate is being ramped up. You cannot be hypoglycemic. Conversely, though, hyperglycemia is not a great thing either. It seems to induce apoptosis, cell death. So you want fairly tight glucose control. But I would say, um, and tight I mean between 4 and 10, not super tight in some papers, between 2.4 and 4. Um, when you pick up the patients, depending on how long they've been in the referring center and, and how long your transport to them takes, they're going to have a big catecholamine surge. A lot of the times their glucose is going to be 18 or 20. I probably wouldn't start insulin on these patients because by the time you pick them up, by the time you load them, and by the time they come to HSC, that catecholamine store might be mitigated. But absolutely avoiding hypoglycemia. Um, anytime you deal with any head kid, glucose almost has to be your number one vital because it's an easy fix and hypoglycemia is a, is a big bad boy. Again, we talked about hyperglycemia. I think I mentioned this in another slide. Um, it induces apoptosis, so this is programmed cell death. Um, it can enhance your reactive oxidative species. It does a lot of bad things. It's not just, oh, we have more glucose, brain's going to be happy. This is something that I really, really anal at when I'm on service is hyperthermia. Every single degree that you raise the brain by, it increases the metabolic rate of oxygen and glucose by about 6 or 8%. We already have a brain in a metabolic crisis. It wants oxygen. It wants glucose. And any sort of temperature is just increasing that demand. Secondly, what's really fascinating if you're able to stick a thermometer in the brain, and let's say the patient was euthermic at 37 degrees, with TBI, that brain might be 38 or 39 degrees. In traumatic brain injury, the temperature of the brain is higher than the core. So even a patient that is 38 degrees Celsius, it's possible that the brain is 40 degrees Celsius. So that means that the brain's cerebral metabolic rate is maybe 21% higher than baseline, a brain that's already in a crisis. So hypothermia is a bad, bad thing. And so that's why I like to target 36 to 37. Anything higher than 37 is a fever because the last thing you want to do is wait till 37.5 and then give Tylenol and wait 20 minutes later and now it's 38. Aggressive management, aggressive management. And transport, you're in the luxury. Um, we have big cold winters. If they're 37.5, 38, just uncover them and they'll cool quickly. And so. Um, be careful, 37 degrees, don't tolerate anything higher, okay? Um, seizure control, also related to the metabolic rate of oxygen or glucose. You can imagine if the brain is seizing, it needs more oxygen, it needs more glucose. If it needs, needs more oxygen, it needs more glucose, it needs more blood. If it needs more blood, the pressures in the brain are going to go up. And so if a kid is seizing, aggressive seizure management as well. And we'll talk about that in our next talk about what the best agents are for that. Okay. How about when it comes to um, RSIing and, and to pre-medicate? And, and what, are the, what are the best drugs for RSI? As we talked about earlier, lidocaine is a great pre-treatment drug because it's safe. 
The downside is we have no idea if it works or not. So if you have medical control on board and they say, hey, let's talk about a little bit of lidocaine, I would never be adverse to that. Don't know if it's going to do anything, but that's a common pretreatment drug. Um, when we... When you look at the literature as far as um, should we intubate these patients or not, a lot of the literature would come up if you want to do your own reading by saying we shouldn't intubate. And most of that literature comes from the US, it comes from EMS providers who aren't experienced with pediatric airways, and it's more of a scoop and run. They have a catchment area, they have a patient, almost similar to WFPS, most of the traumatic brain injuries that come to us within the perimeter come with an oral airway and they're being bagged. And so most of the literature that you'll read in the pre-hospital setting will say that. But again, I don't want to see us as pre-hospital. We are the ICU going to the patient. And consequently, with your training and with your experience and what's best with the patient is to have an airway as, as soon as possible. And why is this important? Well, um, this is important because um, these patients are at risk of aspirating. Um, these, risk, these patients are at risk of not being able to protect their airway. And the last thing that you want to do is to put an airway in a kid um, when you absolutely have to, when they're not protecting their airway, when you have difficulties bagging, when it's this and when it's that. The bottom line is secure that airway and then we can manage the other things. Simple things like gagging or, or coughing with an oral airway in place, for example, if they have a little bit of the, the gag reflex in place, is going to raise their ICPs. And so this is a really, really nice way to secure the airway. And now we can do a lot of the other things, for example, offer sedation, um, not worry about the airway, and worry about ICP management. We can also monitor their end title. And we can monitor end title. However, what I will say is, um, in, in the, the neonate, the literature is quite clear. Cerebral autoregulation, we have to assume, is lost, but cerebral reactivity to CO2 often is not lost, even in the most extensive injury. And so a lot of the times, if the patients are breathing, they're hyperventilating, and neonates are the same way, they do a better job modulating than us. And so um, it's a good point, um, but... Um, the physiology and the way the, the patients um, determine their own CO2 is probably better than what we can predict it to be. Um, so as far as sedatives and neuromuscular blockade, sedatives are nice in a sense that um, if we use sedatives, there's a possibility that we can decrease the cerebral metabolic rate. Um, so that's one potential advantage. The second one is, is that um, we can, um, with some of the sedatives that we can choose that are anti-epileptics, we can help with that. Thirdly, a lot of the medications that we give, if, uh, if they are seizing, like Dilantin and Midazolam, are going to sedate them anyways, and their airways can be compromised. But if they have a tube in place, we need to use sedation. Last thing we want them to do is to be retching and to be coughing when the tube is there. As far as neuromuscular blockade is concerned, that's a little bit iffy because we still want a neurologic exam. And if we paralyze them, the only neurologic exam we have is looking at their pupils. So what I would say is, is that um, sedatives are important as far as tube tolerance are concerned. Min not trying to give a lot of sedatives because we don't want to decrease their pressures. And neuromuscular blockade, we'll have to talk about. So in some instances, you'll have to do it, but it's best to avoid that so you have your neurologic exam. Craig? Yeah. So, um, like you talked about seizure control, if they're actively seizing, but yeah. we won't be giving prophylactic, like we won't load them with Dilantin prophylactically. Yes. Yeah. So again, that's going to be based on medical control. The literature, surprisingly, in kids is not in agreement that we should prophylax for seizures. Yeah. Surprisingly, um, but the 2012, um, it's an option, but it wasn't one of the recommendations. I just wanted to ask about, back to the airway thing and innovating yeah. basal skulls, but I can't remember what we do. So basal skull fractures, um, absolutely nothing in the nose. Uh, so no nasal gastric tube, no nasal intubations. Um, aside from that, yeah, we can intubate through the mouth, absolutely. Okay. Yeah.
So what are the things that you have to think about uh, more so for these kids if for sedation? If we use midazolam, for example, um, what, what are the problems with that? Um, the biggest real problem is uh, it, may it may interfere with our neurologic assessment. Um, it is an afterload reducer as well, and so um, what can happen is it can drop pressure. So those are the big things that you have to worry about midazolam. With fentanyl or with morphine that you're going to use as a side effect, it can cause hypotension, one of the bad boys in, in traumatic brain injury. Um, and that's, all these other ones are, are common, um, but the hypotension is the one that you really have to be concerned about. So how about C-spike precaution as well? And, um, and Todd and I think Ainsley are, are working on, on something along this line. It's surprisingly that we don't have uniformly accepted indicators to put a collar on. And this is something that I'm looking at with, um, with one of the medical directors in WFPS. Historically, um, these are the things that were looked at. So if you, um, if you it basically what it amounts to is high energy collisions um, to a patient who's not protected. So if you are kicked off by a horse or thrown from a vehicle, or you're a pedestrian or a cyclist that was hit at certain speeds. These are all fairly high momentum and, and energy type of, um, of, of injuries. Um, oftentimes, um, if there's a lot of occupants, and sometimes we get a sad story where the driver is dead, you're going to assume high energy, multiple trauma, high energy, neck trauma, high energy. Um, so. All of these kind of give you an idea about to put a C-spine, um, put a patient in C-spine. I would say put the patient in C-spine precautions in all instances of severe TBI and then let us and the neurosurgeons decide if that's needed or not. Um, on your exam, sometimes you're going to go to a kid who's got mild or moderate TBI, um, but there's a little bit concerned. What are kind of indicators that this kid does have C-spine? And again, um, I don't think that uh, we are a team to decide, um, oh, this kid has tenderness, I think we should put in a C-spine collar. The bottom line is, if you feel that a kid needs to be in a C-spine collar, put him in a C-spine collar. This is some of the things that, that dictate that a C-spine is more likely or not, but your job isn't to make that call. You're not neurosurgeons, you don't have MRI. If there is suspicion, put it on. Um, Interesting thing is we looked at uh, a C-spine of Philadelphia versus um, just taping a patient with blocks on. If, for example, you don't have a C-spine collar on you and you're in nowhere Manitoba and they don't as well, there's a very nice review here that says, hey, I don't even know if a collar is a great idea in the first place. Maybe we can mobilize with some tape, some straps, and some blocks. So never think that um, you can't immobilize the spine if you don't have the fancy equipment. If you have tape and you got sandbags or if you have blocks, that's really all you need. And this paper goes so far to say is this is probably even better than using a C-spine collar, um, but the literature isn't clear on that. So you don't need the fancy stuff in order to immobilize. Um, and so more, more papers are coming out by saying rigid collars, I don't know. Um, we've talked to WFPS, um, they use rigid collars. I think we're going to try to get collars that they use so that we're more u uniform. But the bottom line is if you're nowhere Manitoba and you don't have it, it doesn't matter. You can take. So we will be, that was when we were looking at the bags yesterday, we were wondering about that. Are we going to be taking collars? Yeah, so we, we Todd and Ace, I think we were, we were tossing that idea around. What did we decide on? No. Okay. Just uh, there's just too many, too just too much space and that kind of thing. Everywhere we go, we should be. Uh, they should have access. Well, not everywhere, but majority of places we go, we should have access to those kind of collars, and they should be putting them on. We're not going to scene calls, right? No. So we're uh, we're going to a facility. So they've been they've been through some some kind of a transport to the facility. They're in the facility. They should have something there, uh, and then if they don't. We're yeah. going to uh, use bags yeah. and blocks and tape uh, if, if we have to. But there is a lot of traction for maybe the, the pediatric population specifically um, is over-treated with collars. 
But uh, like Greg said, we just have to have a philosophy that at most of the time, if there's an injury above the shoulders, that uh, we're going to, or, or obviously there's complaining of neck pain or, or back pain, then we're going to. The gonna, difficulty is with our bags, and if we're dealing with such a wide range of patients right. that it takes a lot of space up. Yeah. And if there's evidence to suggest even taping and immobilizing the best you can is probably as good. My experience is even in places in nowhere, Manitoba, they have very good trauma supplies. They have Manitoba there because they know that they're the only show in town. And um, there's a few TBIs that have come up from way, way north. I'm surprised. They have a beautiful filly and they had 3%. They have the trauma stuff. They don't have other stuff, but they have stuff to... Uh, um, but if not, worst case scenario, we can, we can tape. So any questions about that? Um, so really a lot of things that you can quickly do at bedside, um, hy mannitol, hypertonic saline, head of the bed, CPP management, CO2 management, those are th uh, seizure control, straightforward things that you feel comfortable already doing um, that unfortunately most centers don't do. Um, we need to do a better job as medical control talking to those institutions that we deal with to, to, to uh, initiate a lot of these things. Uh, but the reality is is that pre-hospital and pre-trauma hospital TBI management is fairly straightforward. Can you just review the glucose? Uh, you said sometimes when we go to these centers and we have a, a traumatic brain injury because of the catecholamines that the glucose can be extremely high. Okay. And you were talking about the insulin, so um, when yeah. is that cutoff point we should start considering uh, the insulin? Yeah, so um, the catecholamine surge probably won't be related to the glucose, that's probably more of a cortisol response, yeah. um, but uh, where's glucose? There's number seven, I think. Like, yeah, like, yeah. 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 Oh, four. There you go. Okay, so um, you have this big catecholamine surge. Your your heart got or your head got walked pretty good. You also have a cortisol surge. surge. Um, your glucose can be low because um, your metabolic demand might be so high that you're unable to meet that, or it might be very high. And in most instances, it's quite high. If it's like forty. That's something to think about. But if it's going to be 18, 20, 21, and uh, you're going to be back at HSC in two, three hours, I likely wouldn't start any insulin because that's a normal surge. It probably is going to settle down, and then you're going to start insulin infusion, and then you run a higher risk of being hypoglycemic as well, which we don't want to do. And so, um, this is more from an ICU perspective, um, giving you an idea, but just something to think about. So our big thing is not to let them be hypoglycemic. Hypoglycemic, absolutely, yes. And that's why anytime you deal with any CNS injuries, be it a seizure, hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy, TBI, hypoglycemia has got to be your first vital when you come in almost. Yeah. So just as a logistics question, mm -hmm. if we go up to these centers and these kids are on the backboards and collars, yep. are we transferring with their backboard? Oh, I don't, know. I don't know how that works logistically. I would assume so, no on their backboard, and then we find a way to send it back to them. I think that's usually how it works. They've yeah. come in with, like, we've had backboards from random places before. So we would transfer with the backboard, like that Yes. Okay. It is quite similar, so that's why I wanted to do these back-to-back. -back. So we're talking about hypoxemic and ischemic encephalopathy. Different than... Um, neonatal um, in a sense because of etiology and because of treatment as well. Um, I should have said in TBI there's absolutely no evidence to suggest that cooling improves outcomes in TBI. In fact the evidence is different. Um, it in fact probably harms outcomes. Now there's three big um, groups. Um, Adelson out of Phoenix looked at it and he said oh I don't know probably doesn't do one thing or another. And Jamie Hutchinson in, um, did a study several years ago and he said, well, I see no difference between the cooled and the uncooled group, but we are trending towards harm. And then uh, when I was in Chicago, there was a cool kids trial that got stopped halfway through because they looked at the stats and they said, I think we're harming kids. So cooling is not, um, doesn't improve outcomes in TBI. Very, very similar story in HIE. So neonatal, our, our protocol is to cool these kitties. Um, for, uh, for, for three days, um, the results or the, the data in PEDS is um, not the same. 
So we're going to again look at the pathophysiology. We'll look at the three most common presentations and then I'll map out a, a management strategy plan for you guys. Most common HIE that we see in kids is uh, post-cardiac arrest. Um, we see hangings and we see drownings. And um, so we'll go over that. Okay, so we talked about ischemia. And that is essentially what hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy is, is that there's an ischemic phase when um, the brain got minimal or no blood flow for a various period of time. And because of that, there are some things that happen that um, are non-reversible, like infarcting, for example. But depending on, on what you can salvage afterwards, not all of it is non-recoverable, and if we maintain physiologic homeostasis, we're able to turn these around to a certain degree. Um, there's a lot of things that are happening here. Um, we talked about energy failure that happened uh, in traumatic brain injury, and with energy failure, what happens is, is that you get breaked out of the blood-brain barrier because of the astrocytes and because of the neuron swelling. There's a lot of other things that happen, and uh, we're not going to go into a whole bunch of detail. Again, you don't have to memorize this by no means, but to, again, that slide on the stroke that we talked about, how cytotoxic edema kind of morphs into vasogenic edema. Understanding here, too, that there's a lot of mechanisms going on at various periods of time here. And so when it comes to management of these patients, it's really difficult to know exactly where they are on these phases. This is really a diagram, but there's several different processes going on and they're overlapping. And so these are, are difficult patients to manage as well. Um, one of the things we talked about was um, an energy imbalance. And, uh, and, and with that, the astrocytes get swollen, the neurons get swollen as well. But one of the things that happens with that swelling is that we have a release of glutamate. And in your brain, you have neurotransmitters. Um, these are chemicals so that one neuron can communicate with another and another. And anytime you see glutamate, glutamate is, um, is an, an excitatory um, um, neurotransmitter. It causes the brain to get excited. Where when you talk about seizures and how we, um, how we stop seizures, we try to influence GABA, um, and, uh, and so there are, there are things that excite the brains and there's things that do not excite the brain, and we are in a state of total excitement. And when glutamate is released, we get a lot of calcium that goes into the cell as well, and uh, calcium is, is not our friend in this instance. And so um, energy imbalance causes swelling, causes breakdown of the blood-brain barrier, causes a release of glutamate, we call this excitotoxicity, and a whole bunch of bad calcium going into the cell. What happens too is, um, because we don't have enough oxygen going to the mitochondria, um, what happens is the mitochondria doesn't function very well. And it causes, normally you see oxygen without its radical, you, uh, you start seeing these free radicals um, develop and build up. And free radicals are very interesting because you can go into those info commercials and stop wrinkling or stop the aging process and all of that. And antioxidants, blueberries and raspberries, they're all about tackling free radical stress in our bodies. And the idea is, um, and I don't know how much science behind it, as we get older, we get a cumulative exposure to free radicals in our body, our free radical load increases in our body, and therefore if we want to live longer and healthier, we have to take antioxidants and get rid of this load. The interesting thing is you and I right now, we are producing free radicals because our mitochondria aren't perfect. Um, as you know, we take in oxygen and we breathe out carbon dioxide and that happens in the mitochondria. But not all oxygen is being converted into energy and carbon dioxide. Um, in fact, our mitochondria aren't perfect. And so we create free radicals all the time. But thankfully, we also have enzymes like superoxide dismutase that's able to convert that into hydrogen peroxide and then through a different, a few other processes through glutathione peroxidase and catalase, we're able to convert that to water. Now we are all doing this to a certain degree every single moment of the day.
But you have this brain that hasn't had oxygen for a period of time. A mitochondria are getting damaged and a little bit lazy. And all of a sudden, we are overwhelming this process so that it's not all being converted to water. It's going downstream and it's being converted into hydroxy radicals. And with that, we're getting damage to our lipid membranes, our proteins, DNA damage, and we're further causing brain damage. So that's our free radical stress. So we should be able to start like blueberry infusions because that's <laughs> probably not a bad idea. Um, this is one of the reasons why when I'm on service, I use carnitine because um, there's evidence to suggest that carnitine mitigates this free radical stress. Inflammation is another thing that happens and, and we don't really know how to manage this or deal with it. You have a brain that is ischemic and a brain that's hurting and the white blood cells are coming to the site and saying, hey, I don't know what we should do about this because um, it looks like something funky is going on and, and they're starting an inflammatory process. But there's evidence to suggest that this inflammatory process is probably good for brain healing to a certain degree. So um, this was the thought of, in the, in the olden days, um, the brains got steroids, for example. We no longer need that, or we no longer do that. Um, I won't go over that. Um, the other thing that happens, do you remember my stroke slide, is we have a period where we have hyperemia followed by hypoperfusion. And likely the problem is, is because we have these glial cells, one hand on the neuron, one hand on the blood cells, and as that glial cell gets damaged, um, the astrocyte, as it gets swollen, it's no longer to do its job. And so it doesn't know, does the brain need a lot of blood flow? Does it need not so much blood flow? Um, at the beginning anyways, we know that for severe TBI and HIE, there's a period with excessive blood flow followed by hypoperfusion. So again, there's a lot of things that are moving on at the brain at this time. We talked about the blood-brain barrier again. In HIE is a, is a massive metabolic crisis. The whole brain is affected, and you can imagine what's happening with these astrocytes as they're getting swollen and we get breakdown in the blood-brain barrier. We've talked about that in our TBI talk. Again, talked about this as well. This is an ongoing process. So a lot of things happening in HIE as well. So what happens to the cells with all of this? Well, we know that um, our patients can get necrotic. They basically die. And, uh, and why is that? Well, there's an energy failure, right? Because there's a period of time where there wasn't blood flow, no oxygen, no glucose. And because of that, the cells um, get swollen because they can't handle water and salt. They don't make proteins. There's inflammatory processes that come in and, uh, and, and kill the cells. So remember I told you about calcium and why calcium isn't a good thing. Calcium starts breaking down proteins in the cells. They stop, uh, they start breaking down fats. They increase the reactive oxidative species. They damage the mitochondria. This is from the glutamate. So again, a lot of things happening in the background. And we'll talk about that. And um, this is just for your pleasure reading. <laughs> Why don't we go into um, really um, the common presentations and the treatment algorithms. And any time, uh, I said that when I'm on service, we can look at x-rays, I'd be more than happy to talk about these pathways because these things get me really excited. <laughs> okay, so cardiac arrest. As we mentioned, the most three common presentations of HIE are cardiac arrest, hangings, and drowning. Now, when you look at the evidence, it seems that the outcomes are a lot better with in-hospital cardiac arrest than out-of-hospital arrest. And I think really the big difference is um, the quality of CPR. Um, and, uh, and even the quality of CPR in hospitals, they've done studies, um, isn't probably what it ought to be because we simply don't do it enough. Um, there's a lot of reasons why we can have cardiac arrest, but unlike adults where it typically is related to hypoperfusion because the coronaries are being plugged, kids have a different etiology. Now what's interesting with um, hypoxic and ischemic encephalopathy is that you have this period where the brain isn't getting great oxygen or no oxygen and then all of a sudden it gets restored and we get this reperfusion process happening and that reperfusion process can be nearly as bad as the ischemic process and so when we look at what happens after the cardiac arrest you can kind of look at it as well we've, we've got um, a ROSC which is um, getting your spontaneous circulation back and in that immediate phase, you don't know if you're going to lose Rosk or not again, right? You're looking at that kid, you're not too certain if that kid's going to rest. 
That immediate period is really an observation period, getting the kid to the PICU and hoping that they don't re arrest again. And then there's kind of a period that happens over a three day where really what we're trying to do is we're trying to limit what damage has happened to the rest of the body. We're trying to prevent reoccurrence and then it's really that recovery stage is afterwards. Now from a transport perspective, the reason why I bring this up is that you might have patients that arrest on you while they're in, in your care. Typically, or you're, you're going to a patient that arrested, typically what you're looking at um, as, as transport providers is this window here, is the immediate post rosc window and the early ones, where really what your job is to do is to, um, to hope that it doesn't happen again, take the steps that um, you need to so it doesn't happen again, and also support the other organs that, that were involved in it. In hangings um, is, is the second one. Um, sadly, um, most of the hangings that happen are traditional hangings in the sense where they're not breaking the C-spine. And I, I don't know if there's any evidence, but I was always taught that in order to break your C-spine, you have to fall as, as, as a distance as tall as you are. So if I were to hang myself, I need to have a free fall of at least six feet in order for me to break the neck. Typically, the hangings that we see are adolescents. They hang themselves from the basement rafters. There's not a fall, but it's an asphyxiation. Um, pulselessness is associated with poor outcomes, obviously. But what is sad is um, the hangings that we often see, um, the asphyxiation is either um, um, incomplete or it's a slow process. But also, you have your carotid bodies that are right here. And if I took my hand and I massaged your carotid bodies really hard, I could induce a dysrhythmia. And with these hangings, depending on where the knot is and depending where the ligature is, not only is there asphyxial injury, but you're massaging the carotid bodies and these patients are at a high risk of, of, of having a dysrhythmia before complete asphyxiation happens. So you kind of look at this here and it basically tells this story of um, pulselessness at discovery is, is usually associated with a very, very poor outcome. When we look at drowning as a group, um, drowning is, is interesting um, because a lot of the kids that we see in winter time um, may have a protective effect with the drowning in the ice cold water. Uh, which is different than in most of the trauma literature that you read that comes from the southern uh, states in Australia, for example, where that's not um, part of their story. Um, we're not too certain um, what to make of the water. When we're, when we're looking at prognostic indicators of, of if this drowning is going to do well or not, we make the assumption that everybody has aspirated, but then people looked at, well, how much aspirate salt water versus polluted water versus um, cold water, that really doesn't seem to have a big effect on outcome. We're not too certain exactly what happens in the drowning process. It's likely a mixture of a lot of things. A mixture of aspiration, obviously. Um, that water gets into the cords and you get some laryngospasm. Um, and with that laryngospasm, um, there's of course going to be brain hypoxia. With kids, very, very young kids, neonates, you slap them with cold water in their face, they, ho they have this diving reflex that protects their airways a little bit. We tend to lose that reflex as we get a little bit older. So what are the poor prognostic factors? Um, and again, this is a, um, a combination of a few papers. Um, kids that are three years of age or older are, are, are tend to be associated with worse outcomes. It's probably because the younger you are, the stronger that diver reflex, the stronger you're protecting your airway, the quicker you're able to slow yourself down. Um, submersion time is obvious and it seems that greater than five minutes. Um, time to initial rescue, again obvious, and uh, GCS when, and acidosis when they come to emergency department. So if you have a kid that is 16 years old, that's been underwater for 30 minutes, has a GCS of three and had poor CPR, that's a really, really bad outcome. But you read these amazing stories, kids six months of age have been underwater for long periods of time, but ice cold water, and, and they tend to do a little bit better.
seems I've heard stories you can drown 24 hours after you're actually. Yes, yes. Um, so you can. Yeah, so that's likely, yeah, so you, there is case reports of um, having these um, episodes where you have a drowning, kid does really, really well, and then they collapse uh, 24 hours later. Um, that a couple of, of, of different pathophysiologies, one may be related to um, pulmonary edema, and uh, the other one is um, a delayed CNS effect. But yeah, that's, and that's why when that's the case, oftentimes you're, they should go to emergency and they need to be observed. Yeah. Um, so water temperature, um, so if the drowning process um, is, is slow and, uh, and the, bottom, the body and the brain will be very, very cool, and we're talking about there's got to be ice on the water, it may be protective. And so if you pick up a kid who's 27 degrees, they, um, you need to warm them up first in order to determine if they're dead or not, because we're not too certain about this protective. Okay. Um, and asphyxiation we talked about earlier. Is there an absolute number they have to do? That? Yeah, so I typically say they need to come to a, a tertiary center and we'll determine that. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, there's been a really